you would turn to Nehemiah. And uh, probably there are uh, ways and means. If we were trained this way in school, I don't remember. But there's good, probably, questions to ask. And not just with the Bible, but in any field, you ask these questions to come up with answers and to get a better feeling for what you're looking for or what you're going to do. I still say this. I think it was Robert A. Cook. Oh, I didn't even bring that one up. Uh, Northfield Baptist, I think they bragged on the fact that Robert A. Cook came there. there and what would be the other name? I brag about her too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I liked him a whole lot. Oh, I don't find anything wrong I didn't with miss him. anything that he put on the radio. Uh, that's right. Robert A. Cook. Well, I'm not saying anything against him. But I'd rather brag that Jesus was here <laughs> than, than that. It w was that of what they would be bragging at. But I, rem I remember that. It was certainly long before our time that he was there. But I, tonight I want to preach on Nehemiah, a type of Christ. And uh, maybe after service, if you could do a thumb search, see if there's anybody else online that believes that. Uh, and I, I don't know, it just, uh, this is not alliterated. And please don't do the thumb search now and telling me about it, do it after service if you would. But with that in mind, I want you then with that thought to come up with a sermon yourself and it's not going to be alliterated so you don't have to worry about all, all the words rhyming or a phrase rhyming or anything like, like that. Nehemiah, type of Christ. Father, bless our service this evening that it would enhance our life, increase our faith, and draw us closer to you now. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Nehemiah, <coughs> a type of Jesus Christ. The book of Nehemiah, uh, we, uh, in uh, class in the institute, we did study this as a book. There is a, was a book that was issued for it. I forget who publishes it or who uh, is the author. Uh, I mean, I have it, it's in my library. And it was presenting Nehemiah as a, a management class, how to manage people, how to get them to do what you want them to do, how to be a leader. And a lot of these corporations, that's what they're interested in. Some will probably actually study a book like this and use it in managing um, corporate headquarters. It's, it's, uh, uh, they are really in, into this kind of thing. Um, I noticed one of the big uh, things they say on the uh, television, uh, and, it, and I said, oh, this must be the new, the new thing that's presented in a management class. And so the uh, leader is usually a political leader. They're standing there, and they ask a question. Somebody asks a question, and there was, anybody knows what their response is? The last 10 or, 10 or 15 years. Anybody know what the, uh, let, let's say they're uh, doing a, uh, a police interview or, what's the first thing that they uh, generally say? Oh, that's a good question. Ever notice that? I never remember that years ago. That must be the new thing on the block. You gotta make the questionnaire feel real good about the question that they ask. And sometimes it's the dumbest question. You know, especially when, uh, they ask a question over and over and over. Or if the sheriff prefaces this, don't ask any questions about this, that, and the other. And the first thing they do is ask those questions. I can never figure that out. But one of the responses that the, uh, the one who's organizing this, they'll say, oh, that's, a, that's really a good question. Whether it was a good question or not, but that must be one of the new management. Well, I've been there for 20 years. Well, 20 years, yeah. Well, it, but they, before that, they didn't do that. I don't ever remember that. It must be something out that, that's new. 
you got to put the question near in a good light so that they don't feel intimidated. They don't feel intimidated or something. There, there's yeah, uh, that is something that has been asked for a while. I said 15 years, you say 20 years. It's been a while. I think it's a way to feign ignorance. Is to do what? Plead ignorance? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, the book of Nehemiah always presented as a management class, used as a means to build a large, well-organized church. Now, this is the way I've always seen it presented. But could it be the real meaning of Nehemiah be overlooked? Now this would be something that uh, we had done and preached on when we did a sermon on Samson and I entitled it, uh, Saints in the Savior's Hand. Who were, in that sermon, who were the saints? Anybody recall? This will be class participation. Samson? Nope. Well, no, the book of Samson? No, 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 no. Not, there is no book of Samson. <laughs> saints in the Savior's hand. Who were the saints? It was a sermon on Samson. No one remembers? Jawbone. The jawbone of what? The ass. The jawbone of an ass. And then who was the Savior? Samson. Samson. If you look at it in that light, all the sermons you hear about Samson then are blasphemy. Blasphemy. They put the Lord in a very negative light. Where everything that they put him in a negative light is everything that Jesus did. Uh, you know, they want to make him, uh, Samson, into this womanizing. He goes from the Jew to the Gentile, th that type of thing. See, from one girl to another girl. The Jew is the wife of God, and the Gentile is the future in church and the future bride of Christ. And boy, when they do that, I, I think to myself, uh, and I have not heard anybody preach about it since, but if I had heard it, I had made up my mind I'd like to talk to the pastor ask, after and present that to him so that every time they do, they think twice about putting our Lord in that light if they look at it that way. And so I'd like to say that, that this is a series of programs, plays, stories <clears throat> where the characters are really the same. They wear different outfits. They have different lines, but the storyline is always the same. The storyline is, story is the same everywhere you go throughout the Bible. And it's hidden through the book. Now, I wrote down some good questions to ask. And, and is that before I prep this, I decided that I, I was probably dreaming and I'm laying in bed thinking, what am I going to preach? What am I going to preach? And so I asked some questions, uh, what he heard, what he saw, what he did, uh, when he went, where he went, what he asked, why he went, and so on. You could ask, you know, it's the, the five W's. What are the five W's? And they're not actual W's, all of them. Who, what, where, why, and how. Yeah, who, what, why, where, and how. There's it's like saying the three R's. How it's has a, a W in it. Yeah, right. Who, what, why, where, and how, and, and, and so on. Those are all good questions. And uh, if you're being trained in certain, especially journalism, and uh, those type of things, they're probably trained in that. And, and usually when they get off the beam, and they uh, forget, it, they forget the basics. They forget, oh wait, I gotta go back to who, what, why, where. They get to that, and it, it, hopefully that it becomes a habit so that you just habitually do it, and you don't have to remind yourself. But usually if you get too far off the reservation, you gotta go back to who, what, why, where, when, and so on, to come up with the right questions to get to the answers that you're looking for, and so on. Concerning the facts. 
Say that again. Concerning the facts. Concerning the faith? Facts. Oh, the facts. Yeah. Right. Right, to, to get to the facts. Now, what I want to do is, with that in mind, making Nehemiah uh, a type of Jesus Christ, I'd like to think, once you see the book in that light, you'll come up with the answers yourself as we go along. What he asked in verse 2, uh, it, it says here, and I asked, verse 2, what chapter? Uh, uh, chapter 1, it says, and I asked, this is not part of the sermon, by the way, but he asks, verses 3 and 4, and they said unto me, the remnant that are left on the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. So verses 3 and 4 is, first, verse 2 is what he asked, in verse 3, they said unto me, the remnant is what he what? If he asked in verse 2, and the word asked is used, the word I'm looking for is not used in verse 3. Someone is speaking to him. So what it, it was what Nehemiah what? What he heard. What he heard. What they told him. Verse 4, and it came to pass when I heard, oh, there it is, there's the word. When I heard these words, verse 4, that I sat down and wept what he did. And so when I began this, I, I thought to myself what he asked, what he heard, and what he did. And I looked at first, uh, chapter 1, and I was looking at the first few verses, and I, I was just thinking, 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 what am I, what am I going to preach on Sunday? You know, the same old, same old, and, and so on. So tonight we're going to present it in a way that you never heard before. Is that the wind? What's going on? Mm -hmm. What do I hear? It, it's not a... Uh, it, is that a baby? Is that, oh, oh, that was... <laughs> oh, there it is. All right, it's Elliot. Oh, I didn't know that. <clears throat> I, I was just afraid it was one of those robots. All right. Chapter 1. We'll begin there. Words of Nehemiah. Son of, I, now I want you to think about the story of the Bible from day one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth all the way to the end where it says the end in Revelation. And what these things can mean. And, and let's not make it hard. Let's make it easy. Words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th years I was in Shushan the palace that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked him concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I mean, we don't have to go any further than that. To find out what the, what the book is about. The wall is totally demolished. Uh, the gates have been burned surrounding the city. It is destroyed. Now, I already told Joe the way I view it uh, this morning, giving him Blues. Now maybe you don't or won't see it this way, but I hope in the end you will see it this way. What it occurred there is a type of what? Anybody want to help out here? What do you see? Everything's destroyed. Was it man destroyed and where was he destroyed? In the garden. Where? In the garden, right. When they ate of the forbidden fruit. Now I know uh, one preacher that I know of. He says the forbidden fruit was a grape. What do we say the forbidden fruit? What do most traditionals say the forbidden fruit is? And they never justify it. An apple computer. It, an apple computer. But where does he find the girl? Under the apple tree. And where is that? Under the apple tree. And where is that? 
I can't hear you. It's the Song of Solomon. He finds the girl that would be the bride in the Song of Solomon. You're right. And, and so I, I think traditionally to say it was an apple tree, I think that's right. And you can prove it and justify it by going to the Song of Solomon and finding that's where he finds the girl, underneath the apple tree. So it is a type where the wall is broken down, everything is destroyed and burned with fire. It's a type of the fall of man. Uh, pointing back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember, this is a play that's going on. That's what I'm liking this on to. MGM uh, Columbia Picture. Uh, give me another one. Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, give me another one. Radio, uh, RKO. Uh, all those silent ones, they formed their own. Uh, United Arts. They formed United Artists because they wanted to break away from the bosses. So it's a program like this in a story, and you can't come up with any other story that's that's not in the Bible. It's got to be in the Bible. Mystery Science Theater. <clears throat> I have no... We're talking about some older ones. Anyway, it, it shows the fall of man, pointing back to Genesis chapter 3. And who has to intervene to pull man out of there? The Lord. The Lord's got to intervene. So our second point, we skip over here to chapter 2. Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 5. It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. And then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servants have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. He makes a request. The servant, which is Nehemiah, who is the cup, I, I believe he's the cupbearer here. He makes a request to the king that I can go. And so if Nehemiah goes and he makes this request, can I go there? What coming would that be? First. The first, the request is made by Nehemiah, who is a type of Jesus Christ, to come. The first coming of Jesus Christ. Now there's got to be an agreement made. The agreement made is between Jesus Christ and God the Father. They come to this agreement before the what? Before the foundation of the world. Early on, the plan is going to be made. In other words, the script is already written. The script is already written. Look at verse 6. Now, in brackets it says the queen also sitting by him. I decided not to look at that. I don't know what that means, but it's in there. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and, wilt, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So the agreement is made between the king and Nehemiah. And so if we go back to uh, where uh, Moses is knocked unconscious, he's, he's found in a deep sleep, and the, there's pieces there of the sacrifice, who passed between the pieces? Anybody remember what passed between the pieces? The, the, the cord of the burning you're, 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 Well, you're, you're close. The, I give you, you, you passed. You, you got an A. 
the smoking furnace and the burning lamp. They make the agreement. Yeah, why well, not? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, Kathy said. The, the agreement is made. The smoking, the smoking furnace and the burning lamp are the two that pass between the pieces. We're not involved in it. It's God and Jesus. God and Jesus. They make the agreement. Without going to other verses to prove all this, you know, I got Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Now, let's get down to verse 7. Now remember, this is not alliterated. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. Till I get there, he wants letters. What then are the letters? You're right. You see how you can figure this all out on your own? Have you ever seen that before? How many letters are there? Pardon? I didn't hear it. He wants letters to go before him to get me over there. Letters. How many letters then are there? 66 of them? Nope. 22? No, it can't be if you're 27. It's got to be what? Oh, you can say Old Testament, New Testament. New Testament's not been written yet. Before his third, first coming, how many letters are written? 39. 39. Our Sunday school teacher has here. 39 of these letters have gone on before to say Jesus is coming. Tell us that Jesus is coming. <clears throat> Look at the next verse. And a letter, another letter, unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber. Now we know it's to rebuild the burnt gates. We know that. To give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house. And for the wall of the city for the house that I may enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He wants letters to convey him over. But he wants one special letter to get some lumber, to get some wood, what would that wood be? Amen. Did you ever see that before? Is that cool? That is cool. It's very cool. That's very, very cool. The timber is then the cross. You may say, now I don't know how many, I didn't go back here in Nehemiah and count the gates. How many gates are there in the New Jerusalem? Uh, and they're made out of pearls. One pearl for each one. There's 12 of them. Yeah, you could say that there could be, I could see where you could come up with 24, you know, the 24 elders, etc. There's all these numbers. There's, there's 12. Listen, every one of these gates have to be in the shape of a cross. Because that's the only way in. Only way in. So he conveys... And he asked letters to convey him over, that would be the Bible, the Old Testament, and he asked for a special letter to get into the forest to cut down trees to get this timber to build this cross. I mean, what else could it be? What else could it be? Backing up to verse 6 again. It doesn't reveal what they talk about. But it, it kind of hints. The king said unto me, verse 6 of chapter 2, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? So they set a time. And when wilt thou return? You're going and you're coming back. So it pleased the king to send me and I sent him a time. I'm going to go. And then that, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And after that amount of time, I'm coming back. So what, what our sixth one in, in chapter 2, verse 6, is really, really telling in a nutshell 
I want to go, and I, and I set a time when I'm coming back. It reveals the life of Christ, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. His resurrection, he set him a time, and when you will return, the ascension. This, when are you going to go, and when are you coming back? The three and a half years. So you're going to go, and you're going to come back, and whatever you're going to do, you're going to do it. And you're going to rebuild this. Shows the life of Christ. Look at verse 12. And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me, you know, before I get to this next point, he rose in the night. He's arrived now in Jerusalem. He is going to view all this. And he has a few men with him. Then who could those few men be? The disciples. The twelve apostles. It says just a few men. So it's the twelve apostles. Neither told I, now I had that one for the uh, eighth one, but the seventh one is stuck in here. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. He didn't tell anybody of what he did. He didn't tell the apostles anything. And when he did, Peter rebuked him. And what is the gospel called? It is what since the beginning of time? It starts with an M. Mystery. It's a mystery. It's the mystery of the gospel. He never told anybody. And then Paul says these mysteries now are being revealed. The apostle Paul talks about it. The mysteries are being revealed. The life of Christ, the mystery, the disciples, some few men. Look at verses 14 and 15. Now remember, he's riding on a beast that he rode upon. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, into the king's pool. But there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. He couldn't get through when he was on the beast. Then I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. He enters another way back. He gets to the one place he cannot get through while he's on the beast. So I'm going to ask you a question. Could Nehemiah get through? Makes me ask, uh, you know, who, what, why, where, ask these questions. He couldn't get through because he was on the beast. If he got off the beast, could he get through? Yay or nay? It doesn't say it now, does it? Could he get through? Come on. I have to say yes, he could. He couldn't while he was on the beast. What kind of an animal is he riding? He's not riding a lamb. He's not riding an ox. I assume he's not riding a horse. What's he riding? And you're close. He's riding an ass. If we go back to the story of Samson and the jawbone of an ass, and it's Exodus 13, 13, the very first thing that's sacrificed and redeemed by the lamb is the ass. We're the ass. And we are redeemed. Can you get through by obeying the law? Never. You can't. The only way you can get through is by grace. The ass couldn't go through, but Nehemiah could. If Nehemiah is a perfect type of Jesus Christ, he could get through because he could keep the law. But we, as the ass, could not get through because it would be obeying the law. We can't do that. We can't do that. We can't get through the gate. The law. Nehemiah can pass because Christ can keep the law. 
The beast, which is the ass, Exodus 13, 13, cannot, be cast, pa cannot pass because no Christian can keep the law. No Christian can keep the law. I hope you see that. I hope you see that. Uh, Nehemiah 2.20. Nehemiah now is arguing with those that want them to stop building. Sanballat, verse 19. Then answered I them, and, and we're not going through the story of Nehemiah so that you know the story of Nehemiah. We assume you already know the story. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we as servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, no memorial in Jerusalem. It teaches and preaches that the lost can not enter heaven. Those that are saved are the only people that can get in there. And these people that resist them cannot get in. We'll never get in. John chapter 7, when they argue with, with our Lord. John chapter uh, 8, when he argues with them. And, and he says, uh, how, how does he put it? Uh, he says, where I go, ye cannot come. You have no part in there, and you cannot. No lost man will ever enter heaven in the new Jerusalem. Just to throw this in, now let's skip over. Nehemiah 4.10. Just for fun, we can look at this in many different ways. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And there's much rubbish so that we are uh, not able to build the wall. I brought, brought this up in a sermon just, just recently. Of, of folks, we are, we are weary and well-doing. Let's <laughs> throw that in there. Look at Nehemiah 3.1. Nehemiah 3.1. Then Elashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even the tower of Meha, and sanctified it under the tower of Hananel. So I got there, the sheep gate. You know, for us to go through, only built by the priests. Christ the great high priest built the sheep gate so that we could pass through. Nehemiah 5.11. All right, so Nehemiah finally builds this wall. It takes 52 days. The wall is done. And uh, uh, everything set up, rare, raring to go. In verse 11, Nehemiah 5, verse 11, Restore, I pray you, to them even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine and the oil that ye exacted, that ye exacted them. And I, I liken that under restoration. In other words, it's likened unto salvation. He gives us back what we lost. He gives us back everything that we lost. All right. Once the wall is built, which way do you come into Jerusalem? By means of what? What they built, what they rebuilt. What did they rebuild? Not only the wall, but what did they build with the timber? What did, you, what did they build with the timber? The gates. The gates. So that points to Matthew 7, 14. Straight is the gate and narrows the way. The only way through there is through the gate. It's the only way in there. Ah... Nehemiah 6, 1 through 19, all the way through the entire chapter. Now it came to pass with Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, and on and on and on it, it, it goes all the way to verse 19. 
It reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him, and Tobias sent letters to put me in fear. So after we get saved, in Acts chapter 4, all the way through Acts chapter 8, the lost will attempt to make you and I afraid. Afraid. Uh, Nehemiah 7. When Jesus left, what did he say in what did he say in John 13, 14, and 15? That he will not leave us comfortless, comfortless but he will send a he will send a comforter. He leaves. And he leaves somebody behind. Didn't he? Yep. Look at Nehemiah 7. This is when I prayed about it. I was asked to be a bean counter in a church. I prayed about it, and this is the verse that God, that God had uh, showed me. I believe this is the specific verse. And, uh, and then when it was time for me to uh, quit, he gave me another verse to show me that I needed to quit, that the honor was given to another man. Even that, this, this may not be the exact verse. But Nehemiah 7, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I had set up the doors, and the porters, and the singers, and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. All right, so who is this brother? He gave the authority to somebody else. And who could that be? I came up with three possibilities. It could be the Christian. It could be the church. Or what did we first say? It then could be what? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. In other words, Nehemiah is leaving. And he puts the Holy Spirit in charge. What about the Bible? Uh, we we got to stick with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we're not comfortless. Yeah. Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 8, verses 16 and 18. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths. All right. What is that feast called? The feast of which is a type of in history. What will that be? It's a type of the millennial rule. The booths are made. It's a type of the millennial rule. Seven days, seventh day is the thousand years. The eighth day is eternity. Now let's read that. See if it says something there. 16 through 18. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths. Every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of uh, Jeshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had the, not the children of Israel done so, and there was a very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the man, unto the manner. They did it for seventh day, days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly. And so the seven days represents the seven days of creation uh, from, you know, a, 7,000 years in the eighth day, then we march into eternity. And after that, we don't know, we don't know what goes on after eternity and into the eighth day. Into the eighth day. The booths. Nehemiah 11. Verses 1 and 2. And the rulers of the people... Now remember, as the story goes on, anybody ever go as a field trip? You know what? We don't have public school children here. 
I was a public servant. I know. We have you. We have me. We have the wife. Did you ever go down to, uh, uh, where would that be? You would go down to Playhouse or something and you would see a play. And usually what is presented would be a Charles Dickens play or it could be Romeo and Juliet and you'd see that. And before you saw the play or when you take it in, what do they have to give you? Ticket. Well, no, not a ticket. It's, is when you're in there and you're a kid, do you understand it all? You don't understand. You got you got to be briefed in all this. You kind of got to be left. A program. You, you got to have a program. So this program is given during this whole thing that that's going on to try to help us get through through this program because a lot of times people don't know what's going on in an opera. Do you know what's going on? Well, all that. Woo! You don't know what's going on. You don't on. even sing in English. Yeah, and they're not even singing in English. So this program's got to be given. Uh, Nehemiah 11, verses 1 and 2. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. One out of ten. And nine parts to dwell in other cities. The people blessed all the men and willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. So if a Jerusalem is a type of heaven, then what is the other cities? If Jerusalem is heaven, and they're dwelling, and they are casting, what does it say? They cast lots to bring one out of 10 into Jerusalem, then what are the other cities? He says in Luke 19, occupy till I come. So one out of 10 is there. You know, like the luck of the draw, they got to go there. Yeah. And the other nine parts, we're still here. We're still here. We haven't entered Jerusalem yet. It has been said, I don't know how they come up with these statistics, there are more people alive on planet Earth right now than have lived since Adam and Eve. Anybody ever hear that? I've heard that. More people are alive right now on planet Earth, still alive. More people than had ever died since the beginning of time. There's probably ways to statistically and mathematically figure that out. So I say this, one part is in heaven and nine parts are still on earth right now. Ah, amen. Nehemiah 13, verse 6. Nehemiah 13, verse 6. But in all this time, it tells the story he, he puts his brother in charge, the Holy Spirit puts the brother in charge. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. He wasn't there. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. In other words, he came unto the king. And so after the the, a lot of time that he had, he went back to the king. And so uh, that is a type of the what? The ascension. He went back just like he said he would. In Nehemiah 2, verse 6, when they made the first agreement, I'll be here for a certain amount of time and I will return. And all this time that this is going on and he's got the Holy Spirit in charge, he says, well, I wasn't at Jerusalem. I was back there, Babylon, with, with the uh, king. I was back there with the king. So it shows the ascension that he's at the right hand of the Father. Verses 6 and 7. And after certain days, <coughs> obtained I leave of the king, and I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil of Elisha did for, uh, uh, boy, when you talk about that evil, and he's gonna get right, he's gonna get those guys. I mean, there, there is the, uh, the battle of Armageddon, man. It's coming back. 
So he obtains leave of the king and he came to Jerusalem. It's a type of what then? If the one was the first coming, it's as plain as the nose on my... Do you see it? Do you see it? Yeah. Isn't it so simple? There's the second coming. Now, throughout my Bible, I have places like that where I mark off a couple of paragraphs that were shown me by another preacher. It, it, here's a span of 2,000 years. The death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, the return. And it may go just uh, one paragraph at a time. That is the second coming. All right, Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13, verses 19 through 21. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates... Now, you, you say, you might say, well, that isn't quite in the order that it is that we're taught. Well, that's why you have to have the cliff notes. And for this play, you've got to have, of Romeo and Juliet, you've got to have and know what these opera singers are saying to get the story. So it's a little out of order. Verses 19 and 20, it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of the servants said I at the gates that there should be no burden brought in on the Sabbath day. So uh, on the Sabbath day, which day is that? How many days is, is that into the, day, into the week? Is the Sabbath day the sixth? It's the seventh one, the day of rest. It's the day of the millennium, the millennium. It's the day of rest. You're not bringing that in here. You're not bringing that into the city. You're not coming through the gates to do commerce. This is a time of rest. All right? So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodge without Jerusalem once. All right? Or twice. Isn't that interesting? Not only once. But they did it twice. Two times to cover how much time? They did it tw twice. 2,000 years? Yes, sir. It covers 2,000 years. And when the 2,000 years are over, you're not, coming, you're not coming back here to do that. They weren't permitted in. They did it twice. And, they, he, and he says, look at verse 21. And I testified against them and said, why lodge you about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. They did it twice to represent the 2,000 years that they're trying, they're trying to have this commerce before the rest. And so then they rest on this. Uh, 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 nothing's to be brought in on the Sabbath day. That's the millennial rest. Listen, folks, we had 21 points. Can you see all of that in there? Yeah. And you know what? I probably didn't even scratch the surface. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I think it's the coolest thing. That all that preaching and teaching of how to build a big church and how to manage things and when in the end it's nothing more than the nothing more than it's nothing it, it, it it's no tougher than the whole story of the Bible and the first coming the second coming of Christ the story is right there right before our eyes all right and it's and it's hidden from the eyes of the unlearned hidden from the eyes of those that can't see it Shake hands before leaving. 
Now I'd like you to find out, does anybody else believe that? On your clicker. Who is, who is this that you found this from? Say that again. You said you read this from somebody else? No, I did turn? not. No? No. Okay. I just wonder, does anybody else believe that or teach that?